All right, with that, we're going to start uh, the tutorial. So first I'm going to talk about SGS3. Uh, so again, that's joint work with, uh, with many people, uh, in particular, Eduardo and Jasper are here in the, in the meeting. So goal uh, of SGS3 is to have uh, support high level definition of the concrete and abstract syntax of programming languages, make it understandable and executable and declarative, right? So you shouldn't have to understand parsing algorithms to write specifications, and it should be multi-purpose, so we want to do many things with a syntax definition. It's really a work in progress. Uh, we only have been working on this for about 30 years or so, so it's still uh, still improving. Uh, so the first version of SDF was, uh, uh, was described by, in a paper in uh, 1989 by Hering, Hendricks, Clint, and Rakers, and Paul Clint was my, uh, my advisor. Uh, and the basis of SDF, uh, the parsing algorithm was generalized LR, which was developed by Jan Rekers. In my, during my PhD, I worked on, uh, on SDF2. I designed SDF2, so the, the follow-up language, and I designed the scannerless generalized LR parsing algorithm. Uh, and, uh, and recently, we've been doing a lot of work uh, and, and designed SDF3 and, um, with many nice features, as you'll see. And, uh, and Eduardo finished his uh, PhD thesis last, uh, last year on that. So the basis of SDF3 is, uh, is context-free grammars. Um, so we don't do context-sensitive uh, syntax, uh, uh, but it provides a lot of sugar to, uh, to, be, uh, to be expressive. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, so I have a slide with, or these slides are about, well, this discussing uh, SDF3 in, in various uh, concepts, but uh, what I'm going to do now is actually show you how SDF3 works, and, uh, and then we'll see if we can rediscover those, uh, uh, those ideas. Okay, so I'm going to switch screen now. Um, right. And um, syntax. All right. So now you should be able to see my screen. I think you can. Um, okay. So this is uh, spoof X in, uh, in Eclipse. Um, so what you do when you create, uh, let me, uh, let me demonstrate that if I create a new project, then you can, uh, there, uh, so if you, if you use the, uh, the, the spoof X installation, there will be a, uh, spoof X language project wizard that you can create and, uh, and you fill in things like, uh, well, what what meta language do you use for syntax? Uh, what meta language do you use for? Uh, for type checking, and can you create a uh, a testing project and a examples project, and so on? And then when you do that, uh, you get something uh, something like this. So a uh, uh, a project, and there's a bit of uh, there's a tutorial in there. Okay. Um, uh, so there's a trends directory that has the, the main Stratego file that runs things. Uh, there's a target directory that's, that's where, where, where compiled uh, things are uh, go. And uh, there's a syntax directory, and that's where, we're be, where we will be working on uh, in, uh, at the moment. And then there's source gen where a lot of generated uh, stuff goes, and we'll have a, have a look there. We will start. Uh, we will start with the syntax definition. So, uh, so we we'll see here that uh, SDF three is a modular language. Uh, we see there's a module called London, which is the name of this uh, of this language, and it imports another uh, module Lex, which we'll uh, look at in uh, in a bit. But in general, you can define any number of um, uh, you can define any number. Uh, let me switch to. Right, uh, of modules uh, splits your language definition in a in number of modules. And uh, furthermore, what, what we can do in, uh, uh, well, so you can write uh, examples, of course, uh, 
and you can write tests. So what I've done is I've written a number of tests for the language. Uh, so I, of course I do test first development. So I've, I've defined the language I want to build using a large number of these uh, unit tests. Uh, and, and they're in, the, uh, in a language called SPT for SpoofX testing language. And in this testing language, you can define a little language tests that allow you to express, well, this, is a, this should be a program in, uh, in the language I'm going to define. And, and parsing should succeed for this. Or parsing should succeed and it should, uh, and it should parse to this AppSec index tree. So basically our exercise now is to, uh, to make these tests uh, succeed. Because as you see here, um, the, uh, some of these tests don't, uh, don't succeed. Uh, the other thing we see here is a, I've made a sandbox file, which is a, an example in my programming, in the, the, the language I'm, I'm working on. And I can, uh, you, sh you do see my, uh, the, the menu when I open this menu. No. no. Okay. Uh, so there's a, a, a spoof X menu here that says show, show parsed AST. And when I do that, I, uh, I get this, uh, this term over here uh, that, uh, that represents the, uh, the parse tree of this, uh, of this program. Okay. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's get to work. Um, what we need to do is uh, uh, make more of these tests succeed. So for example, here it says there's a unary minus and uh, so what I do, I write a, a production and um, let's call that a minus. And uh, what I do is I, uh, whoops, I don't want to print. Uh, unary minus. Um, like this uh, is a production that uh, that has a uh, has an non-terminal. It has a constructor, so that's the name of the AST I want to construct, and it has a uh, and has a, has a body, and this body is the uh, is uh, so what I it's a bit well okay. So here is one another way to write uh, these uh, productions is I quote uh, the lexical uh, non-terminal and uh, or and then I have a non-terminal. Uh, the alternative way to do this in uh, in SDF3 is to uh, to use templates. So I basically I I uh, quote everything and then I anti quote the non terminals in the in the production. And we'll see later why that is uh, why that is useful. Well, okay. So let's try a few a few more. Uh, so I have an addition. So uh, I've forgotten how to type. Uh, well, I can copy a few, I guess. Um, what else do we have? Uh, multiplication. And, um, and minus. And that's about it. Uh, well, okay, I get a few warnings here and it uh, complains that it says uh, duplicate definition for constructor adds. Um, so uh, constructors should be uh, unique. Uh, uh, so a, a constructor uniquely identifies a um, a, uh, a definition. All right, so I can uh, I can build it. Uh, so there's a uh, either uh, what do I do? Um, Alt Command uh, B uh, builds the project, and there is also a menu the project that build project and that's uh, that builds it, the thing. And I, if I uh, re uh, uh, test the uh, the test over here, then we see that uh, a couple of tests now uh, started to succeed. The uh, thing you observe about this grammar or that is not uh, not clear. All right. So why is the minus sign test not passing because of the space or? Ah, 
Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, let's try Actually, it out in, uh, in here. More interesting than that. It was passing before you introduced mean production ah. and st stopped parsing up. Was it really? So, yeah, <laughs> it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't failing. So I guess uh, before it was passing parsing as an integer literal, uh, as Lexer probably dictates, and now it it is parsed or become parsed as a mean production. Mm -hmm. Right. So so let's see. So uh, so now I've undone this this uh, production. Now the test succeeds again. If we look at the, the AST, then we okay. see that indeed this is a lexical uh, minus two. And now if I reintroduce this production, uh, let's see what what, uh, what happens. Um, the uh, the test fails. And now let's let's have a look at the example. And now if you look at the parse tree, then actually what happens? It fails because the results. Uh, so actually, if I would say um, uh, parse succeeds, then the parse would be fine because actually it, uh, it does right. succeed, but uh, it doesn't parse. It, but yeah, so the problem is it's ambiguous. And uh, because now it could be minus two the constant or minus uh, the constant two. And uh, so this is an example of an ambiguity. And first of all, what you should observe is that uh, SEF3 can deal with such ambiguity. So you can uh, just write ambiguous syntax and we can uh, and you can parse such sentences. Um, for example, I mean, are there other such things that you notice? So is that why it's not complaining on the grammar because it can deal with the ambiguity? That's right. Uh, actually, we do have uh, ambiguity detection for such uh, expression grammars, but I haven't enabled that for uh, uh, and that wouldn't uh, actually complain in the in the editor, but on the on the console. Um, but see, do you see other ambiguities? I see another uh, funny thing that it supports left recursion without any complaints. Uh huh. Right. So, for example, if I would um, let's say three plus uh, five. Um, Right here, we see we have another uh, ambiguity, um, right? Because how can, how can we make the white space between the minus and the two significant? I, I'm sorry, what? How would we make the white space between the minus and the integer significant? Right. So, what is what? What, what is it? What that you would like? Ah, so okay, so so let me not tease you further. Let, let's look at the um, at the lexical syntax. And that minus two example. Yes, I understand. So right, so the, let, let's go back to the minus two example. Um, it's ambiguous, and let let's have a look at the lexical definition of integers. Right, I I here I'm uh, I'm saying a uh, an integer content is defined by the sort int. And uh, that is defined here as a lexical sort that is defined as an optional minus followed by one or more digits. Uh, and I have a lexical restriction here that says uh, a, an integer shouldn't be followed by a, uh, uh, by a digit, right? And that, that ensures longest match of, uh, of integer constants. But uh, here I've commented out another restriction. And, uh, and basically that is the restriction on the uh, the context-free minus, so the, 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 the unary minus. Uh, and here I'm saying, a, if I have a unary minus directly followed by a, uh, a, by a digit, that, uh, that shouldn't be allowed. And, uh, and so this is a subtle um, trick I, I, I discovered just uh, uh, two weeks ago or so. So I'm distinguishing the, uh, the character class. Uh, yeah, so these things are character classes, right? So this is the character class zero to nine, and this is the character class with the character uh, minus. Uh, uh, so this says that the, uh, let's see if I can, oh, uh, right, so the, the minus sign over here would be uh, equivalent to, uh, to minus uh, exp. And basically as I'm saying, this minus should not be followed directly by a, uh, uh, by a digit. And so now, if I um, if I uh, save this and build this grammar with this added uh, context-free restriction, then 
the ambiguity should go away, and and this should be interpreted as the uh, uh, the minus constant, and uh, whereas this should be interpreted as uh, as minus of a uh, of a constant. Make sense? Yep. All right. Um, Okay. Well, maybe before you continue, there uh -huh. are several people okay. asking about the difference between the angle brackets and the square brackets in productions. Right. Uh, there's none. Um, so you can use both to uh, to quote uh, syntax. And um, so I was using uh, uh, the... Uh, the uh, the square brackets in the minus case because I have using a uh, JetBrains font and uh, if I do a, a, a less than and a minus then it has ligatures and it turns it to, into an arrow, left arrow and that's uh, uh, that, that's a bit confusing. So that's uh, that's that's why I was using that. Uh, there are other reasons for using um, um, Square brackets. So, for example, if I would have a uh, sorry, a greater than, uh, then I want to use a uh, a greater than sign, and then it uh, would be annoying to have to uh, to use the uh, the angle brackets. Uh, I could use uh, I could do it like this. So here I have a less than, and I could then escape. Do I need to escape there? Um, let's see. Uh, so I'm hoping that gives it cynic, so I can escape, but that's a bit ugly. So I, uh, so we uh, we have this variation of uh, quotation symbols, but otherwise they're in not significant. Other questions, Jasper? Um, we have some test cases. So from Joel, does it support now also minus two, minus minus two? So that's in the. Right, so that's the is that the last test case or is that? Uh... Uh, so it's in the SpoofX panel channel. Well, let me see. So what is the... Well, let's just try it. Uh, it seems to parse, uh, and uh, hmm. But it is ambiguous, um, so so we need to uh, we need to talk about that. Um, but I first want to to talk about the other ambiguities. Um, so Alexander mentioned uh, left recursion. In general, can you see? Uh, well, I mean, I already said that. Right? I mean, if if I have a a, a, a sentence like this, uh, then it's uh, whoops, then it is. Ambiguous, right? I mean, and and so first of all, as your tree and the underlying parsing algorithm. So the underlying parsing algorithm is a, is a is a generalized algorithm, so it can deal with arbitrary context tree grammars, uh, and therefore with ambiguity. And what it and instead of giving you uh, conflicts uh, in the parse table, you will see a um, uh, what you get is is all possible parse trees. So basically, in, internally it builds up a parse first. So a compact representation of the parse trees. Uh, and then when you print that or sort of implode the parse tree to an abstract index tree, then um, uh, you get a term like this, uh, including ambiguities. Uh, and those ambiguities can be nested. Can we, can we demonstrate that? Um, right, and here you see that, that ambiguities can be, uh, can be nested. Um, anything else I'm forgetting, Jasper? Um, so I was just checking the SpoofX channel, and indeed it helped uh, Jason to get clear um, why okay. there wasn't a big team when you showed the, the ASTs. So that seems useful uh, to show them. Right, good. Okay, so now let's see how we can uh, solve ambiguities. Um, so uh, rather than sort of rewriting the grammar to an unambiguous grammar, right? So you you know the sort of uh, expression terms and factors grammar that you uh, that you see in uh, in compiler textbook. That is those those tend to become uh, rather ugly, I find. 
in SDF, you can use uh, priorities and associativity declarations to disambiate your grammar. So typically what we have is that uh, uh, these operators are uh, left associative. Um, and let's see, let's add a, uh, a power, which is typically uh, right associative. Um, and maybe something like a comparison is uh, typically non-associative. So you want, you don't want uh, a greater than b greater than c, and uh, the same for uh, for equality. Um, right. And if we uh, use those rules, then that already solves a bunch of ambiguities. For example, now if I say uh, if I say this, then uh, I have a single parse tree where we see that addition is. Uh, is left associative. In addition, we can then define uh, priorities. And, uh, and now you see that we use these uh, constructors to construct ASTs, right? So a, uh, the constructor add is, is used to define the, uh, to construct the, the parse tree here or the, the abstract index tree, but we can also use them to uh, refer to productions in, uh, in priority rules. So typical rules would be um, minus bind stronger than uh, power, bind stronger than multiplication, and um, addition and subtraction are mutually left associative. And um, so now when we uh, build this, this uh, complicated trees like this. Um, whoops. Ah, yes. You can always forget um, some priorities. Um, equality and greater than are mutually left to non-associative. And now we get an unambiguous, uh, an ambiguous tree. And now if I would say, so what does a non-associative mean? So if I would say uh, this equals that equals, uh, equals that, then it used to be the case that we would ma make non-associativity a, a, a parse error. Uh, but in fact, that, that was really uh, not a very good uh, user experience uh, because, well, you I mean, logically you you sort of uh, know what you're what you're writing here, but then the parser would fail, and um, and so now instead we're giving a, a warning that says that the operator is non-associative, so you need to add uh, parentheses, uh, which leads me to uh, to see that I need to add parentheses, and so what is uh, what is what do parentheses look like? It's a production like this. And, uh, and we annotate parentheses with, uh, with the brackets uh, attribute, uh, which means that uh, we can ignore that attribute in, uh, in an AST. So for example, now I've uh, explicitly disambiguated the non-associativity. And if I, uh, if I parse this, I get an, uh, a right associative uh, equality uh, expression. And, um, and the bracket is not present in the uh, in the AST because that's not relevant typically for uh, for processing. Um, let's see how did our tests go? Wow, they all succeeded. Excellent. Um, let's uh, look at some other features. Uh, how we're we doing for time? Um, Elko. Yes. There are a few questions. Go um, ahead. What are the... Uh... So first one, does this IDE do completion? I guess you're going to talk about that later or... Uh, I can... Really. Uh, sure, uh, we can do that. Uh, do we do completion? Uh, yep. Uh, it would be nice if it would insert a... Uh, yeah, so, so based on the... Um, on the syntax definition, so uh, I talked about multi 
purpose uh, syntax definition, right? So the uh, the idea is so with, with a grammar uh, like this, uh, what we do is we generate a parser that uh, parses uh, strings and gives us uh, parse trees and then maps it to ASTs, right? So the, the with the constructors, we immediately indicate a one-to-one -one mapping from uh, from uh, a, from parse trees to uh, to to ASTs. Um, but we can do many more things. Uh, so, for example, uh, we generate um, a syntactic completion uh, from um, from a syntax definition, right? So, uh, so these things are, are placeholders. And um, when I do uh, option um, space, then I get a, a list of proposals with uh, with completions, and that is useful, especially for new languages when when you uh, when people don't know the syntax and they want to explore the syntax, you can use this to uh, to explore the the syntax of uh, of a language. Ah, interesting. Uh, huh, I hadn't seen that feature before. So right, I I have a minus and I uh, propose uh, an equality. An equality has has higher priority than um, or lower priority than the the, the minus. So if I would complete with, with an equality there, then I would get a different tree. So when I choose this, it actually inserts the, uh, the AST there. I didn't know about that feature, Eduardo. Did you? Uh, that's, uh, or yes. is that, does that come about from, from parentis, automatic parenthesizing? The, the parenthesizer does that. Right. right. So, yeah. so yeah, so that's another feature, um, uh, parenthesization, right? So I uh, so we use these templates to uh, to generate pretty printers. Uh, so if you have uh, if you have a, a, a compiler or a language processor that produces these kinds of trees, then you want to be able to uh, turn them back into into text, and, and that's a process that that typically called pr pretty printing. In the past, what we did was well, we had to write these pretty printers by hand, which was very annoying. And at some point, we generated default pretty printers from a grammar. But then every time you updated the grammar, you had to update the pretty print tables. And it was it was pretty uh, pretty annoying. Uh, now what we get is a, uh, is a formatter that is automatically uh, generated from, uh, um, from the grammar. Uh, where's my example? And uh, all right, okay, it's not very pretty. Um, um, so maybe we can do something about that. Um, so, but are there other questions before I move on to that? Um, There's a few questions about ambiguity detection. Uh, so for example, from the Spoofx channel, mm -hmm. does a tool Warn the programmer about potential ambiguities before generating a parse tree. Um, not in general. So, so as I said before, we do uh, uh, generalized parsing. So we, we we accept any uh, context-free grammar. Um, and in general, ambiguity detection is undecidable, right? So. Um, but uh, recently we have worked on ambiguity detection for expression grammars. So we do detect uh, ambiguities in uh, where you are, you have missing ambiguities in an expression grammar like this. Um, um, so we cannot detect all kinds of ambiguities, but these kinds of ambiguities we can uh, detect. So for example, if you have missing, uh, uh, missing productions in your priorities, for example. Uh, the the interface is a bit clunky. It shows a bunch of of uh, priority missing priorities on the on the console. Um, so is that a, that is an answer? Okay. Um, we have a different question about the possibility to for user defined operators, which is an interesting uh, question, I guess. You mean languages with user-defined operators, I suppose, right? Um, uh, yes, I think that's the question. Yeah, so uh, can you support extensible languages uh, in, in general? And in particular, uh, Mixix. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is all about extensible uh, extensible grammar, right? I mean, you can, but um, uh, but that is, we don't have built-in support for 
build supporting languages with Mixfix, uh, with Mixfix syntax. Um, so basically that means, yeah, so we don't have extensible, extensible parsers. Uh, we are working on some ideas, but uh, that is uh, uh, too premature to, uh, to discuss at this, uh, at this point. All right. Yes, uh -huh. I mean, we, we are supporting Mixfix in, in the language, right? We're defining and, and, we'll, and I'll show that in a, in a bit. Um, yes, Jasper, go ahead. Uh, yes, so there was another question all about the bracket um, annotation. Mm -hmm. So why that's required online? Okay, so well, let's 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 remove the bracket annotation. Now it gives me an error, and it says missing attribute or constructor name. So each production should have uh, should have a constructor. So I, I could say have a let's have a, a bracket constructor, and now um, um, now what we'll see if we get the uh, the AST of this language is that we get explicit bracket constructors in the in the AST. And typically, when we build uh, build a language, we're not interested in the brackets, right? I mean, they're not semantically meaningful, so we want to uh, to leave them out. And that's why we have this uh, this facility that basically uh, turns brackets into uh, into uh, uh, extra extra syntax. Does that make sense? Um, So maybe before I I uh, go to uh, formatting, let me show uh, do, do a few more productions. So here I uh, because there was also a, a question about Mixfix, right? So here I have uh, a, a, the, the next language feature is we want Boolean operators, and uh, including if then else. And uh, so let's have a look at uh, at those. Um, And uh, let's steal those. We have an and, and we have an or, and we have a not. Uh, and we have or. And what else do we have? We have an if then else. Uh, Call that an if, right? And that is a typical mix fix expression. So if expression, what is it then? Uh, an expression else expression. Whoops. Um, Again, well, so I need to extend this, uh, the priorities here. So let's say that, um, Probably if then else should be non-associated. Should be? Non-associated. Like Why? Quality. Uh, I, otherwise, how it's supposed to, you know, left nest, if then else closes. Uh, oh, it should it should not be left associative. Is that what you said? Yep. Or should be non-associative. Um, well, you want to be able to combine if then else statements, right? Um, um, of course, you don't need the associativity there because you don't. Oh, well, if then else is not. Um, no. That's right. It's not. It's not. Yeah. So associativity is for infix operators. So uh, if, if if it's left and right recursive, uh, only. Um, otherwise, you need uh, you need priority uh, definitions. Um, um, so with this design, it appears that should, if you were to have an if in the uh, in the antecedent in the then expression um, of a of an if expression, then the else would become ambiguous. Is that correct? Um, I, I didn't get the questions. If you have a, an if then, is that what you, without oh, the else? Or no? There's, there's no uh, else list if, so I, I take that back. 
it, it seems it seems okay. Yeah, I think it's related to dangling else problem. We can do dangling else. So let, let's uh, so let's let's first have a look at the test. Uh, we see now that uh, uh, test succeed, right? Well, we can we can write uh, uh, if not uh, true and false, then uh, just b else c. Oh, there's a, uh, it doesn't parse. Oh, and I didn't have, uh, I don't have, uh, I didn't, I don't have identifiers yet. So there we go. Um, right. So this, the, this parse and, 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 and I can combine this, right? I mean, I can have a, uh, let's say a, then and then an else and then an if uh, three whoops then uh, four else five and this is fine right uh, there's only one way this can be uh, can be parsed uh, um, so the 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 later if is a, a child of the uh, of the of the earlier if and there's no other way to parse this right Alexander. Yeah, I think so. Well, again, as long as we only have uh, expressions and like no statements, no blocks, there should not be a problem. Um, At least I never experienced such a problem with just expressions and mm -hmm. uh, things start, start. But the problem would be if there's complicated only when you have statements and blocks of statements. And, uh, and if there's overlap between you have an if then else or if you have a if without an else, I think it could be the problem, right? When you have two the two options. Right. I mean, I didn't add an if then else uh, here because uh, an if then, because in a in a, in a expression language it doesn't make sense semantically, right? Because I mean, what what is the value of an if then? Um, but 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 syntactically, I mean, of course we can do anything we want. Uh, so let's uh, let's have an uh, an if else. Um, and let's see what that uh, how that works. So, uh, what would be interesting if we remove the this right? Um, and now this becomes ambiguous. Uh, now let's uh, for a start let's give if else the same. Priority as if because now we get ambiguities that have nothing. Well, actually, that's we're going to get the same. Um, yes, All right here we see the typically the typical dangling else ambiguity. Either it's uh, uh, the it's the outer if else, uh, so the else belongs to the outer if, or it's the inner. Uh, I've named them wrong. Uh, this is should be if then. Um, this is confusing otherwise. Um, so the if if the is the if else and um, and the if then is the is the is the is the if without else. Uh, so here we're seeing that the uh, uh, here the else is associated with the outer if, and here the else is associated with the inner if, right? And that's the typical uh, dangling else uh, priority. And um, now the typical way to solve this is to say that that we want the else to belong to the closest uh, to the closest if, and we can express that using a uh, using a priority. Um, and uh, and then. Our ambiguity should go away, right? So now we have an an if then, um, and an if of an if then else, right? I mean, this is the uh, the syntax we get. Does it make sense? Um, so there's a few questions about lexical syntax, uh, Ilko. Okay. 
So for example, uh, about rejecting keywords. Uh, so would, like to, would you like to take them now or maybe a bit further? Um, uh, that's a good question. So, okay, so let's let's talk about lexical syntax. Um, uh, so I think Peter wrote uh, earlier in the in Slack that uh, his spec variant was uh, integrated uh, scanning and and um, and contact tree syntax. And actually, that is the same in in SDF three. So in SDF three, uh, we don't have a separate scanner. Uh, the, the the parsing we use is scannerless, and so we also don't have a separate uh, lexical syntax definition. Uh, so I have, I have defined the lexical syntax for this language in a separate file, in a separate module, but it's not a separate language. Um, so, yeah, so th there is a distinction though between what I call here lexical syntax, and here I've called these things context tree syntax. Um, and think about what that might what that might mean, uh, why why there would be a distinction. But let me first look at the the, the, the features. So what we what I'm saying here is I'm defining identifiers as starting with the character class of letters and followed by zero or more letters and digits. And uh, we do lexical disambiguation by means of uh, follow restriction. That's and that's this kind of longest match for uh, for tokens. And it's saying a, a, an identifier cannot be directly followed by a letter or, or digit. And we already saw this similar for, for integer constants, right? They're an optional minus sign followed by uh, one or more digits. And that shouldn't be followed by a digit. And, the min and a separate minus sign shouldn't be followed directly by a, a digit. And I can define si similar, uh, similarly, I can define uh, the, the, context, the, the syntax for other lexical categories such as strings or, or layouts. Um, Is that the lexical sorts uh, similar to like the states on a, something like a lex or jlex? Uh, no. Uh, so lexical sorts are, are the same as sorts, right? I mean, I've, I've for expressions, I've introduced a sort and it's just a, a non-terminal. And um, and uh, and lexical sorts are lexical non-terminals, if that uh, if that makes sense. Uh, so here, yes. okay. So the, the so the, the real terminals of an SDF tree definition are character classes. So characters are the terminal symbols of uh, of grammars, uh, also called character level grammars, right? I mean that is the the real the real terminals. Um, so these are different sorts of sorts. Well, there are not so different. Um, I mean, there are basically non-terminals, but still I make this, diff this difference between lexical sorts and le lexical syntax and context free sorts and context free syntax. Um, can anyone imagine why that would be, uh, why they are different, why, there, why, why this distinction is made? What does layout mean here? That's, a, that's an excellent question. That's going in the right direction. So if we look at, uh, at a sentence like this, right, then we see that it conforms to, a, uh, to the, the context-free syntax we've defined here. We have some keywords, and uh, then we have a space, and then we have an operator, and then we have another space. I've never defined that uh, uh, well, so so the question is, can I, if you look at this template, you could think, well, there can be one space between an if and an expression, and uh, and not more. Um, but actually, I, if I write two, that's fine. Um, so implicitly here, I've said that between uh, these two symbols, right, the the if keyword and the, and an expression here, there there can be white space, and in fact, uh, there can be uh, there can can be comments uh, here. Um, and uh, and if I comment out the, the rest of the line, then uh, well, I get a syntax error. But uh, so let's say comments, uh, then I get uh, a comment there, right? So basically, everywhere between 
these places, the, 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 in the body of a context free Phoenix production, I can use white space or comments. And that, that, is, uh, that is what's called layout. I mean, that uh, using white space, we, uh, we turn a textual uh, uh, program into a two-dimensional uh, picture, say. Um, so layout is here defined as white space, right? So it's spaces, types, new lines, and carriage returns. And also, it's also defined as comments. So it can be um, uh, multi-line comments, C-style, or single-line comments, C-style. Um, and implicitly, uh, the, uh, the, the symbols on the right-hand side of context free Synex productions are separated by layout. And um, so, and yeah, so I was talking about sin uh, sugar. So let's, let's see how we can um, uh, generate, where is it? Generate SDF, uh, I guess normal form I need, right, Eduardo? Um, Sorry, I was answering questions. What are you trying to do? To uh, to get the is do I shoot? Yeah, let's just try normal form, right? Um, so the If we look at this grammar, and if I uh, normalize that, then this is really the input for the parser generator. It is a whole bunch of uh, productions that say things like uh, dollar is defined in this in terms of this character class, which supposedly is the dollar sign, and uh, plus is defined in terms of this character class, and the equals literal is two uh, equal signs, um, etc. Right, so. Literals like uh, like keywords are not are nothing more than non terminals for a a bunch of uh, uh, characters. And uh, similarly, um, context free productions like uh, the addition production um, is sugar for a, a context free production that has the an expression and a plus and an expression. But uh, in between those things is optional layout. So we can have optional layout between every, uh, every two uh, symbols in a context free syntax production. Um, and that means we can have a white space or, um, or, or, or comments at, in those locations. And the distinction with, uh, uh, with lexical syntax is that um, for those um, generate, um, we get similar productions, right? But if we look at, for example, the, oh, what a mess. Um, Um, there it is, right? So the uh, the production for uh, identifiers is the sugar to a production, a lexical production that has that starts with a character class representing uh, letters, followed by zero or more uh, letters or digits. But there's no layout in between, right? I mean, and that is the only difference between context free syntax and lexical syntax that uh, the characters of a token should not be separated by white space or comments, right? I mean, if we, if I write, uh, if I write a, a white space over there, then it, sh then it should no longer be a, uh, a keyword. I'm guessing. Uh, error recovery may be kicking in or uh, no, okay, so now we get a parser error, right? So there shouldn't be any white uh, layout between the characters of a, uh, of a lexical syntax. So that is the, uh, the difference, and that's the only difference between lexical syntax and context-free syntax in, uh, in SDF. By the way, while we're at lower level, could you uh, comment on uh, support for uh, UTF or 
Oh, Unicode in general. Uh, yes. So Martin uh, recently added support for Unicode, and uh, I have to admit I haven't actually used it yet, so I don't. Uh, I don't know. Jasper, do you can you say anything about that? Um, yes. So we recently have added support, and that's for example applicable to uh, define Unicode operators. Um, something else that's currently missing is, for example, to define complete character ranges in Unicode. So you could think of a certain characters for symbols in a certain language. Uh, Unicode, Unicode defines character sets for that. Um, so we did not yet get at the point that we have abstractions or shortcuts for using these uh, sets directly. But for basic support, and for example, to define Unicode operators, um, yes, support is recently added. Yeah, thanks. I see. Well, still, I have another question for quite some time. Uh, Ilko, could you mm -hmm. please uh, clarify this um, difference between lexical constraints and context-free constraints in lexical grammar? Right. Okay. So, as I as I was showing in the um, right in the, the normalized. Um, so the difference between lexical and context-free is that uh, in context-free we uh, we separate symbols by optional layouts, but we also make a difference between the non-terminals. So you can use it a non-terminal at the lexical level and at the context-free level, but we you don't want to accidentally insert context-free syntax in a, a lexical syntax. So therefore we uh, we uh, suffix. Uh, such on terminals with CF for context free productions and with lex for lexical productions or for lexical non terminals, and thereby we, we isolate these, uh, these layers. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, that and, part makes sense. And then, oh, and yeah. then, so, and the follow restrictions, um, like we saw here, say uh, some non terminal cannot be followed by some character sets. Uh, if it's lexical, then the follow restriction is on the lex version of the non-terminal. If it's context-free, then it's on the non if it's on the context-free version of the non-terminal. Um. Okay, I see. And then in this kind of compiled form, uh, we have both lexical kind of rules and context-free rules for lexical identifiers or lexical sorts. Well, in the normalized form, we only have sort of syntax. So it's just plain context-free grammars where we have made this distinction between lexical and context-free syntax by injecting these layout things and by distinguishing whether things are lexical or context-free production or non-terminals by, by the suffix. Uh, but otherwise it's just a plain context-free grammar basically with characters as, uh, as, as, as terminals. Right, so the basis is really, um, Plain context free grammars while well, extended priorities. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thanks. Now I understand almost all of it. Right. Um, we'll start. We'll st we'll talk about symbol tables in the in the in the second part when we talk about uh, static uh, semantics, uh, Peter. Right, and there was a question about layout sensitive syntax, right? So I mean, someone said uh, layout as in as in as in Python, and indeed, uh, so some languages like Python, they're the layout. So, so in the language I've shown here, layout is uh, irrelevant, right? I, I can uh, lay out my program in any, any way I want, and it will just it will just parse. In a language like Python, it's it's the the if and the else should be aligned, uh, or something like that. Um, I was and just answering that uh, question on Slack. I'll also post a link to Eduardo's paper about right. uh, layout sensitive parsing. Good. Yes. So, so in SCA3, we do support layout sensitive parsing using layout constraints. I'm not going to, to demonstrate that uh, today. Um, so, if there's no, so then, uh, then, so we were talking about parenthesizing and, uh, and, um, and formatting before. So if there are no other questions, then I, I'm going to go back there. 
Um, so, um, so with these uh, formats, um, and we, we, that's ah, you shouldn't you shouldn't uh, quote me, Eduardo, because then I get a notification. <laughs> uh, all right, all right, that's all right. Um, so, uh, so using a, a grammar, a scenic definition in, SDF, in SDF, we get a, a parser and we get, and as you see, we get a, um, a syntax directed edit. Well, a, a, well, we get, we get um, uh, completion, right? With, uh, with placeholders uh, that you can complete. And uh, we get syntax highlighting, we get, uh, we get error recovery. Um, and, um, Right, so I mean, so here we have a tree that's not fully um, syntactically correct, but we're still getting. Eh, we're not getting any parse tree here. It's not uh, not enough to. Uh, uh, to recover from apparently. Um, and let's see. I lost my train of thought now. Uh, but so another thing we're getting is a, is a pretty printer. So from an AST, you also want to produce text again. And, uh, uh, and, and that's what, you, what we see here, right? So using, uh, I, I invoked format, which takes the, uh, the, uh, the AST and then formats it using basically inversely applying the, the production that we saw here, right? So taking a constructor and then applying the template uh, that we see here, and now you see, now we can see why the uh, the templates are relevant. Because, well, if you look at this uh, program here, it's not very uh, nicely formatted. Uh, let's say I add another uh, uh, copy of this expression there, um, then uh, it becomes quite uh, unreadable. So. Um, now, what you would then do is make a pretty printer that, that makes a more interesting layout. And in the past, what we did is do that uh, sort of manually, separately from the grammar. But actually, what you would like to do is, is uh, to automate that. And using these templates, we make that, uh, we make that uh, explicit in the, in the grammar. So for example, if I say this is typically how I would like to lay out uh, if and else statements, um, then I can... Um, I have a more reasonable uh, pretty printing of, uh, of, of programs. Um, so this is not, these are not producing uh, super duper formatters and they're not uh, sort of user um, adaptable. I mean, that is something uh, that would be nice to, uh, to work on. Uh, but they're, that's, it's a really a pretty good uh, basic formatter that you need in all kinds of uh, language processing operations. And, and it comes out of the box given, uh, given a grammar. Um, another thing that you need in such a formatter is, uh, is parentheses, right? So for example, if I have a sentence like this, um, um, uh, I don't have per ident uh, let's let's add identifiers. Um, All right. So if a sentence like this, we see that uh, multiplication binds stronger than addition, but maybe I want to have a different uh, uh, association so I can use explicit uh, parentheses. Um, if I uh, parse such a sentence, then I get a different uh, parentheses. And as you see in, in the in D, I, I, I lose those brackets, right? Because as uh, if you want to pro do semantic processing of such a tree, you're not, not interested in, in, in the parentheses. So we just throw them away. But if you pretty print, uh, you better get uh, this. You get better get those parentheses back because I would pretty print this without parentheses. Then I would get a bit and, and parse that again. I would get a different uh, a different tree. So indeed, if you pretty print this, it will uh, add the parentheses that are that are needed. But but only those that are needed. For example, uh, if uh, let's say I add. Um, 
parentheses around this, right? Uh, uh, actually, right. Uh, now, uh, the uh, the parse says, well, we have an addition with a mul multiplication as parents. But if I format that, uh, then it will remove the parentheses ar around the multiplication because they are not needed to disambiguate the sentence. And um, well, maybe the, the human reader actually found those parentheses useful, but actually, but, but our parenthesizer inserts the minimal uh, the, the parentheses that are minimally uh, needed. Um, Any other questions? It seems quiet on the... Uh... For, for this parentheses example, mm -hmm. um, is there a way to get the actual original source code sort of plumped through like that? I think another example I'm thinking of is how you were treating comments as layout, which can be inserted arbitrarily between context-free uh, symbols. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to sort of propagate that through as well so that you could have right. access to those if you wanted to for doc comment generation or something like that? Yeah. and. Uh... Well, the answer is is uh, no at the moment. So the so what happens is while um, um, comments are part of the text, and we do character level parsing, scannerless parsing, right? So they are part of the parse tree. But actually, when we implode parse trees to ASTs, we lose the the comments. And um, yeah, so typically in, in semantic processing, you are not interested in those in those comments. Um, but what we do do is we uh, store origins in the in the parse tree. For example, to uh, which we'll need, for example, in when we do a type checking, to uh, display error messages in the IDE. And we have done work in the past to uh, where we do transformations, refactoring style transformations on trees, and then we want to restore the original program, right, rather than compile the program. And then it's important that you that you preserve uh, comments. And so we have done work on, uh, on 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 doing that. So and basically what we do there is use these origins to use the the original text, so where possible, and only re-pretty print the parts of the text that have have changed. And but also moving comments uh, as necessary. For example, if you move a code of uh, a block of code with comments, then you would also move those uh, comments along. Uh, so, but we ne badly need to uh, sort of revive that uh, that piece of code. It got lost in the, uh, I, I wouldn't know where it is at the moment. So, yes. Um, other questions, Jasper? Uh, what is the time complexity of generated parsers? The time complexity is cubic. Uh, of GLR parsing, supposedly. Um, and, um, but in, uh, yeah, that's the, the, the theoretical answer. Um, so Jasper is doing work on, did his master's thesis on uh, performance improvements on scannerless parsing. So the, um, uh, the, uh, Idea was that, uh, or the perception was that GLR parsing was slow, um, and uh, Jasper has do, been doing, did work on that. I mean, a, a couple of years ago, and is still, we're still working on that uh, to to further elaborate on that. Um, <laughs> I can close my window, I guess. Uh, the. Uh, where was I? Yeah, so the performance. So, uh, oh, okay, I'll open it back. Uh, the uh, performance. Right, parsing performance. So we did some work on performance optimization of the parser. And one particular optimization that we've tried out um, was to specialize the parser for deterministic um, sub-languages. So in the case that you're parsing uh, part of a program that's deterministic, then parsing actually can uh, be applied in linear time. Um, so we tried it out um, and it was limitedly effective uh, because in practice, yeah, only small parts are 
actually uh, deterministic. And that's uh, yeah, a problem that we, for example, also see in the effectivity of incremental parsing, which we are currently uh, developing. So a master student is developing uh, incremental, uh, an incremental parser for spoof X, um, which works, but its effectivity is also dependent on how deterministic a language is. And in practice, um, not that big large parts of programs are actually uh, deterministic. Well, that parts of SDF grammars. So. Right. So the the uh, scannerless parsing causes more uh, kind of local ambiguity. If, even if you completely disambiguate the grammar um, using priorities and such, uh, then there are still sort of in, in a in a LR grammar you get immediate look at because you throw away layout during scanning, so you know exactly then. Well, the, the next token is a plus, and so we know which. Which direction to take, and here we first have to parse the um, the layout before we know what uh, what direction to take. So there's a bit of uh, non-determinism, uh, non-determinism there. Um, but so one thing that that turned out is that uh, we after parsing we do this implode implosion step, so from a parse tree to an abstract index tree, and it turned out that 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 wasn't implemented so cleverly. And implementing imploding uh, in a better way sped up parsing uh, uh, quite a bit, and, uh, so that was a nice, uh, a nice catch. And so there's all these kinds of simple operations that you think are are not important, and uh, so you don't, you, you may not pay attention to them, and they may uh, have uh, uh, big performance problems, or they may cause, uh, yeah. Uh, let's see, are there other things in syntax that we need to discuss? Composing languages. Uh, what is the question exactly about composing languages? Well, okay, let's do that. Uh, so let's, let's start. Um, uh, have a, a query language. Um, uh, well, let's do it properly. So I have a uh, uh, and normally you would you could define this in a separate uh, in a separate module, right? So I have a query language, and um, uh, I would say query. Query is um, from, I don't know, QID star uh, select. Um, I don't know, what do you do in a query? Um, select expression. Now, this is a very simplistic query language, um, but it has its own lexical syntax. And it has query IDs, which are just, well, they're just always uppercase letters, right? Um, um, no, let's make it more interesting. Let's make them um, proper identifiers. Um, so now we have a separate query language. And, uh, uh, so we need a query condition. Uh, so it has conditions. Um, and a, what does a condition look like? Um, I've forgotten my SQL, but let's... Uh, I, yeah, you should really select expression where... So there's a, we, we have a from and where, right? And the condition is... Uh, uh, you still have to specify select what? And that should be expression. Yeah, sure. <laughs> like from where select something. And you'll get link. Okay, here we go. Yeah, you, sh you should have uh, kind of get this where before select and it would look like link in C sharp. OK, 
Okay. Um, and in my query language, I'm using expressions from the language, and I'm I have uh, and I'm using. Uh, sorry. So this is a so-called injection. So I'm just saying you can use a query as an as an expression. And uh, now uh, let's see what this uh, what this does. Um, from A and B, select uh, D where A equals B. Right? Is that so? Uh, um, I miss something. Do you not have identifiers? Uh, I did add identifiers to oh. language. Uh, um, is a query a valid expression? Well, let's see. Doesn't look like it is, um, but I did define. Well, okay. There we go. Okay. Uh, there's something wrong with my query identifiers. He should have more than one character. Ah, well spotted. That is what I intended. Okay. Um, so now I have uh, added queries to my language. And, uh, but typically if, right, I mean, I, I uh, would have say an SQL syntax in a separate, uh, separate language definition. I would like to import that into my language. Uh, now, I don't want that from and select become keywords. And, uh, let's say, because I also want to have identifiers that, uh, right, I want to say uh, from plus, uh, plus a query, uh, if that would make sense. Right, and now here, this from is a, is a variable, uh, but this from is a, uh, is a keyword from, uh, from a query. Right, so we can do, um, yeah, so the, the, because we do scannerless parsing, that means that based on the context where we're parsing, uh, the, uh, we decide what, what we're interested in. And on the left-hand side of a plus, well, we, we have a, a from, uh, from the expression language, and here we have a from from the, from the query language. Um, question about mm -hmm. this in particular. Um, what do the error messages look like um, in the case that for example, um, you had deleted the DE token, um, and so this was not a valid query. These then all become identifiers in the expression language. Right. So what? What? It's, let's see. So I've made an error, right? And if we parse this, then what do we get? Is uh, yeah. Then they become identifiers, uh, indeed. Um, and, and so there's error recovery. Uh, so it's uh, in addition to sort of normalizing these grammars, what, what the, uh, the tool will do is will, it will create a so-called permissive grammar where that will be able to uh, parse things it cannot otherwise recognize as so-called uh, water tokens. 
and and they will be basically interpreted as layouts, right? The, the, the parser said, well, if I cannot recognize this, then I'll uh, I'll just add it to the to the layouts. Uh, so I'm just sort of thinking in terms of like um, the when a use when a end user is actually using this language, and they they have an error like this, um, it would be really nice to be able to say like this is a malformed query. Right. Um, True. And um, here it seems to be. It, right now, I think when I saw you mousing over, it was I expected a minus sign, right? And that's that's going to be really unfortunate <laughs> uh, as a as a user experience. Um, it seems like. Let's try this. Is there a way uh, to sort of. Yeah. So so. Um... Well, I mean, the first thing here probably is to is to redesign the syntax a bit and to have a uh, a list of identifiers and and so make the the base grammar already more permissive, right? I mean, that that would uh, catch that uh, that kind of error. Uh, but here I'm improvising a bit and saying, uh, well, okay, so I've added a um, a recover production. So normally these recover productions is is what is generated by our permissive grammar. Uh, generator, but basically I'm saying, well, here's a, a thing t users typically uh, generates, uh, but it's wrong. Uh, only try to use it when parsing fails, and now you see that I get the, the proper syntax highlighting, and um, and then and I actually get an ambiguity because I need a next call restriction. Um, there. So you can fine tune your grammar uh, with such uh, um, with just such recover productions to to cater for these kinds of uh, for these kinds of cases. Um, Right, and now I actually get a a, a parse tree, an abstract syntax tree with a with this query error production that you can use to um, to suggest uh, better uh, error messages, for example. I see. So if you want the if you want better error messages, you kind of have to do that on a on a manual basis. There's not really a um, there's not like the the uh, the parser doesn't really actually remember its state. In a sense, like it doesn't. Well, we. I mean, there's that it tried to parse it as a uh, as a query. Well, that I mean, yeah. Okay, so so let's. So that was a question before. How about keywords, right? How about reserved words? Mm. And um, because I think that is related to your to your question. So, um, so what we've seen so far is that uh, keywords like if. Are automatically recognized as as keywords, but there could be cases uh, that that uh, becomes. Let, let's, for example, add. Um, so this is a functional language. So we want to have function application, um, and function application and functional languages uh, they they really like it like this, right? No, no parentheses, really bare bones. So there's no operator. Um, Separating function and arguments. Uh, this is really bad for uh, for ambiguity, right? So, uh, um, because now, so let's right. remove this again. Let, let's make our syntax a bit better and have a you select from uh, from zero or more cases. Um, and typically, I mean, often it's it's an idea to make the grammar a bit more uh, permissive, right? So to have, say, uh, zero or more identifiers from which you select. And then you could always have a semantic error message that said, well, you forgot to give a uh, an identifier there. Uh, that gives better, uh, often better results. Uh, but now if I parse this, I'm going to get uh, bad ambiguities, right? So, because there is a... Uh, uh, did I already? Um, well, okay. First of all, I want to. I should. 
uh, give a priority to application. So it's typically we make uh, application I as priority operator. Um, that should improve things a bit. Um, yeah, that's already getting better. Uh, but really, I meant to write a, uh, a query here. Um, oh, and actually, I get one, right? So I, I get uh, it, it can be a query or it can be a whole bunch of uh, applications. And uh, so now that what we do. So okay, so so what what I didn't do? Let me let me put this in comments. So a similar issue is if I have if uh, a then b uh, if just this. Um, if we look at the, the AST, then I, we see two possible AST, right? It's an if, uh, it's an if then, or it's an application where if is interpreted as a uh, as an as a variable. So that's annoying, and that's typically not not we, what we intend. So we want to uh, reserve words. So uh, what do we do? Is we can say that we don't want to have keywords as uh, as identifiers, and we can express that using so-called uh, uh, reject productions. And um, ah, no, the other thing is the other. Yeah. Right, so now what I've done is say if uh, uh, if I can parse something as an as an identifier, but also as a keyword then we should reject it as, a, as an identifier. And that's basically a way of having uh, reserved words. And, and this says we should have a follow restriction on keywords, so a keyword shouldn't be followed by, uh, by letters or digits. And now um, I should get the proper uh, AST that I, that I wanted. Um, and now, well, I've defined this for QIDs, uh, I could define the same for uh, for ID identifiers. I could say the same for QIDs. Uh, and now, um, I basically, I cannot uh, do this anymore. Um, right, so now, um, so now I have excluded uh, from as a uh, as an identifier. Uh, I could be more specific and have have um, uh, more specific context free syntax rules and saying that um, uh, if is rejected as a as a uh, keyword for identifiers uh, and um, from is uh, well maybe from as well because that is really typically a, a disting distinction between um, between um, identifiers or be between expressions and queries. Uh, but for example, uh, I don't exclude selects from, um, um, from QIDs. Um, and then I can uh, I can use select as a as a as a variable in my uh, in my expression language, uh, but not in the uh, um, but not here. Right? Um, uh, I cannot use it. Uh, actually, I can use it there as well. No. Right. Actually, I can use it as an identifier in. In query languages now, right? Because the uh, I've only excluded from and if as as uh, as keywords. All right, I think we've covered uh, 
syntax. At least I'm One more thing. Um, uh, so this parses um, even while if then has higher or has lower priority than plus, right? I mean, you, you might think that uh, since uh, if then has lower priority, it shouldn't be possible to be a child of an. Uh, of a plus, but that is uh, that would exclude sentences from the language. And in recent work, we have uh, we have uh, improved on this. Uh, uh, specifically in Eduardo's thesis, uh, we have dealt with such deep priority conflicts, and this is now correctly parsed, right? As an addition of an if, uh, where the addition in the in the then branch is in, is inside the uh, the then branch, the then then branch. And uh, so this. These priorities do the right thing, basically, is the, uh, would be the slogan. All right, Jasper, Eduardo, anything else I should say about, uh, about parsing? Um, not, not that I can think of. I've been trying to answer, answer questions on Slack as well, so. Okay. Right, yeah, so there have been many good questions. It was nice. Uh, I think one question that might be interesting to discuss is, uh, can you parameterize a language by another language? And can I have queries over some given exp expression language? Uh, right, so uh, in SDF2, uh, that uh, did actually have such a feature. So you could parameterize a module with a, uh, with a non-terminal or several non-terminals and then use those in your, in your language. Um, and then, uh, yes, but in fact, we can, we can do that, right? I mean, if I, so what I've done here is I've defined a little, a different language and I've composed, composed the two languages. I've said add uh, query expressions as, uh, uh, as, as new expressions. So basically what I do, I, I define two modules. Uh, the language of expressions, the language of queries, and then I can make a composite language that combines the two. Uh, but maybe uh, that it was not quite the the, the 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 sense of parameterization that you meant. Yeah, I think it was Peter's question, and he had to uh, ah, he had to leave. Uh, okay. Right. Well, and also in in this example the where clause of your query language depends on the expression type from True. your sort of surrounding yes. language. And so I think maybe that's the part where like, could you define this query syntax where the expression part is substitutable from whatever you're embedding it in? Yes. Uh, well, I mean, typically I would have something like, I mean, there's a, there's a whole, I mean, a non-terminal, like there's a query expression. Um, um, actually let's, let's make it, um, uh, um, I mean, there's there's just query expressions that is that is part of the query language, and then I can com compose that and say a query expression actually can be uh, can be an expression. Uh, so you that's can instantiate the query sort of fragment only once. That's the only sort of downside of this encoding. If you want to have two expression languages over different things, then uh, in 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 one language, let's say. And that wouldn't work with this encoding. Right. Yes, it's it's a global composition. And in SDF, we actually had parameterized non-terminals. In SDF2, we had parameterized non-terminals. So you could make uh, expressions parameterized with queries and expressions parameterized with something else. And then uh, you get you could have se separate copies in these. And um, yeah, designing such a parameterization feature is uh, uh, well. We, we haven't quite figured out what what we weren't quite satisfied with the, the SDF two mechanism, and somehow we haven't decided how how it should be done in SDF three. So that's an open um, open to do. Other questions? What does the API provide to be used as part of language implementation? Right. Be interesting. Yeah, so it might be interesting to say a few words about 
integrating languages defined in Spoofvex um, outside Spoofvex. So have we had some questions about that? Um, so the internals of Spoofvex are written in Java and are and those are Java uh, JVM based. And for example, uh, given um, a syntax specification uh, as is visible on Ilco screen, uh, you could use Spoofvex to generate a parse table uh, and just a parser and actually use that as a uh, yeah, Java library um, outside Spoofvex. So any JVM language such as Java or Kotlin or Scala could import um, the, the language and the, the parser basically as a library. So if you want to use um, the parser in, um, in another pipeline, um, yes, there's, a, there's what we call Spoofex core, which can be integrated outside, uh, uh, outside the Spoofex ecosystem. So uh, yeah, there's basically a distinction between Spoofex core, the internals, which is JVM based, and yeah, the environment where we're currently looking at at the Ilco screen is the integration of Spoofex Core in Eclipse, such that there's actually an editor in which you can edit and use the language. Um, but there's, for example, for example, also a binding to the command line, such that we can you know, run a language on the on the command line. Does that answer that question? Um, let's see the last question is Spoofex panel. Yes, thanks. Great. Okay, so there was a question about pattern matching. Can you define a language with pattern matching? So uh, why not? Uh, um, and that also brings up another feature. Uh, so here, uh, another sort of small but very useful feature is uh, in many languages you have repetition, right? So like, um, which I've used uh, before. So like Deco plus is, is one or more declarations. Uh, here I've, I also have a repetition, but with a separator. So often in EBNF you see, you re repeat a tuple of things, but here we, we repeat cases and they're separated by, uh, by bars um, rather than uh, uh, ended by bars. And so let's see if uh, match expression works. So uh, match I with uh, B, C, or uh, D goes to E. Does that work? Yes. Um, and there you have a, a pattern match, and they can also be. Uh, uh, pat I mean, they can ap have application patterns, right? So we could have uh, x axis, and then uh, here we do, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, right, so now we get uh, uh, pattern match cases and the patterns can be, uh, can be actual, actual patterns. And, and this thing uh, works with uh, uh, with deep pattern, right? I mean, if we if we get um, matched or uh, nested patterns, so let's see, I do a uh, match uh, axis with um, I don't know uh, I'm not sure what you want to do here. Uh, but uh, uh, something like this. Then you can see that this might be uh, ambiguous, right? Because this uh, case could belong to this case, this match, or it could be belong to this match. And, um, um, and it is indeed uh, ambiguous. Um, so what did I forget? I guess I need to add the, uh, oh, I need to add a lo longest match, right? Uh, um, and that will, 
give me the proper disambiguation where the uh, uh, the case belongs to the inner inner match uh, similar to the uh, the dangling else. Um, was that what the question about pattern matching was intended to be? Uh, don't know where it was anymore. Um, that pattern matching. Uh, what about uh, prefixing the first case with bar? V is bar new. I'm sorry, what? Bars? I didn't get the question. Like starting, that. starting the case expression with bar. When you write like match A with bar new, bar cons. I don't. Or, or camel style. When first case yes. starts with bar. Starting with the, with a bar, uh, Elko. Oh, like, you have like case. Uh, I guess. Separate. Yeah. Like oh, this, yeah. is that is that uh, OCaml syntax? I thought it was a separator in OCaml, but we can. Uh, we... No, it's possible in SML and OCaml. But it, then it's optional, tradition. or is it required? Uh, but let's. Uh... It works both ways. Yeah, it's optional. Right. Well, actually, uh, there we have uh, like composed pattern matches. Uh, you're not necessarily end up case with uh, this arrow, right arrow. You can kind of immediately start another pattern matching, and they are kind of conjoined. Uh -huh. Or okay. no, with or this or this, and then uh, oh, the right. common the, the common uh, consequence for them. Oh, there's a bar in the patterns, is what you're saying? Yep, probably. I don't know how syntactically they can represent no. it. Right, How but I think I, th I think there it's a separated uh, like this. Uh, and then, right, but then it would be something like this, right? I mean, that's the, uh, uh, so now you have an or pattern here. Um, so it's this case or that case. Um, and otherwise, these are um, right. And I have a, I don't know, a nil or a cons. Not sure. Is that going to do the right thing? Um, yeah, this is not. Now we need priorities for the patterns. So pattern dot p app. Is greater than. Pattern dot p or I guess something like that. Yeah, I see. Thanks. Uh, all right. So I think we should move to. Uh, to the second part of the tutorial, uh, unless there are any burning questions about syntax at this point. Is um, there a way to extracting syntax highlighter or target language? Extract. It's the syntax highlighting is really a feature of its parsing and mm -hmm. right. So we don't generate a sort of so syntax highlighting is parser based. We we parse the text, we get a parse tree, and then we get a token stream, and then the token stream is analyzed to generate a syntax highlight. So it's not so much that we can generate a, um, a, uh, yeah, a highlighter by itself, uh, sort of a syntax highlighting grammar, as you would have in some, uh, some editors, if that is what you meant. Yeah, on that note, have you kind of looked into this LSP protocol, language server protocol, and mm -hmm. kind of integrating, uh, I don't know, this <laughs> language servers generation? Well, right, so, so one of, one of the uh, right. generation on top of that. We have done some experiments with that. Um, uh, we definitely, um, 
had the ambition to to in integrate with those kinds of air editors. So the problem with LSP is that it doesn't include Synex highlighting in the protocol. Uh, so you it, they expect to do Synex highlighting using regular expression on the client. Um, and so that is um, one shortcoming of, of LSP, as I understand it. Um, and otherwise, I mean, yes, you can use um, an SDF-based parser as an, as an LSP parser, I mean, uh, in principle. So I should say also that uh, the parser generator for SDF generates a parse table in term format that can be interpreted. So the, the parser is really an interpreter for parse tables. And it's easy to, uh, well, it is possible to, to re-implement the parser for other, uh, in other languages. So we have had students uh, writing a, a SLR parser in Go and then deploy it uh, in, and then translate it to WebAssembly and deploy it in the, in the browser, for example. Um, so these things are, uh, are certainly possible, but uh, so the, for us, the problem is maintaining a large set of such implementations is, is problematic. I mean, it's, um, yeah, I mean, we're already doing quite a bit of engineering, maybe more than would be necessary for, well, getting our papers published, say, right? Uh, and, um, but I, I'd like to get real working tools, but maintaining a whole suite of implementations for different platforms would be nice, but it's uh, not something I can easily afford with the, uh, the PhD students I can scrape together from uh, from funding, right? Um, yeah, that's totally understandable. Right. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So uh, what I propose to do now is to switch to the second part of the tutorial.